Um, what Bob's going to talk about today, though, is his latest book, um, Slaves to Fashion. And I want to say how important I think this book is for our current discussion about um, globalization, but also about sustainability and about many of the things that the groups outside in, in, uh, in uh, the uh, area out, out behind us um, are doing. Um, there was a lot of talk about sweatshops, the, re the renewal of sweatshops, um, changes in global capital. Um, and there was certainly an anti-sweatshop movement. There were boycotts around the country that students were leading, and, and, and people were debating these issues. But, uh, and, and there were a number of books that came out um, kind of addressing some of these. But I think Bob's book is the first one that really brings a kind of substantive research element to the project of trying to not only analyze global capitalism and what it means to workers and to working conditions, but also to bring it to, um, to us with what I consider Bob's most, the most important contribution with is that Bob brings us this information with this kind of activist social justice perspective. And so not only is Bob's work, I think, kind of, you know, top of the line when it comes to sociological research. Um, when I think of real sociologists, I think of Bob. Um, but he also always does that with, with this set of values that's committed to social justice, committed to trying to give us the tools to change, this, change society for the better. So I'm, I'm honored to have Bob here to talk to us about uh, his research and his work. i um, honored to, uh, to call him a, a colleague and, uh, and proud to call him a friend. So let me introduce Bob Ross. Thank you, Corey, and thank you, everyone, for coming uh, this morning, still morning. Um, <clears throat> every time I come to Worcester State College, I have a really good experience, so uh, I agreed to uh, come when Carrie, there's Carrie, Carrie reached out to me uh, with no hesitation. She offered me a small honorarium, and I said, well, I'll forego my high six-figure uh, fee <laughs> <coughs> to come here. Uh, I'm going to make some comments at the end of uh, this talk about uh, the apparel industry uh, in both historical and global perspective with some comments about sustainability. Um, uh, but I want to start with a, uh, a brief way to think about this matter. We, we often and appropriately think about the issue of sustainability in terms of physical resources and human impacts on the physical environment. Can we continue to extract petrochemicals at the rate we're extracting them? Can we continue to create uh, greenhouse gases at the rate we're continuing them? still have a world uh, in which we hope to live with ease and convenience. Uh, on the other hand, there's another way, an additional way, a complementary way to think about sustainability. Are our human practices those that will allow us in the long run to create and sustain a human community where each may achieve his or her full humanity? That is a different, somewhat different question than the physical question, um, especially in light of our current practices, both on a national and local and a global basis in which I don't think we can say we are in a long-term sustainable uh, direction in terms of uh, achieving this goal of human actualization. So, I have in mind uh, today uh, three women. Uh, on the far right uh, is a woman whose picture was taken by Kara Metz while Kara was a photographer and editor on the staff of the Garment Workers Union in Manhattan. Uh, this young woman in this picture is often used as the poster girl for the anti-sweatshop movement. You can see her on the cover of my book, and she, I've actually marched with her picture on a, uh, a picket sign uh, uh, from time to time. She was an underage worker in a shop which later proved to pay uh, illegally low wages, below the minimum wage. What was poignant and devastating about her appearance at this place in Manhattan in the mid-90s is that she was in the old garment district, 
which was the home of uh, the most powerful union in relationship to its industry uh, in American history, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. In 1950, uh, when women bought Easter dresses, 90% of those dresses were made in union shops. And a significant fraction of them were made in the 30s, the streets numbered in their 30s in Manhattan, where, by the way, my own father was a cutter in that industry, cutting the patterns for those dresses. So it was particularly poignant that this uh, renewed sweatshop uh, industry should appear in the heartland of union strength where sweatshops had been abolished for a generation or more. And that's part of the story I want to tell uh, today the fall and rise of sweatshops in the United States and the way globalization and the political and social policies that uh, are associated with it have brought that about. The second uh, picture uh, was taken by me in Managua or a free trade zone or a small settlement outside of Managua near the La Mercedes uh, free trade zone on a trip I made in the year 2000. The young woman in the picture uh, lives in a uh, shack that, whose walls are made out of plastic sheeting. There's one light bulb. She pirates the electricity off the town supply. I was walking around actually with a city councilman. He says, yeah, I know. It's what she can do. There, she just doesn't have any money. Um, and her uh, toilet was uh, a hole in the ground in back of her house. Uh, ringed with plastic uh, shower curtains for privacy. Uh, her husband was a full-time, that is seven day a week, 10 to 12 hour day worker making jeans. Yet, in Nicaragua, in, at the turn of this century, uh, those w the wages that he was able to earn with that level of work got him that one light bulb shanty. And finally, uh, the uh, woman, uh, at the young woman at the bottom of the picture is a, is a trimmer in a Beijing garment factory uh, whose uh, picture I took in 2002. And I'll leave uh, for a moment uh, a fuller description of her situation. But in fact, uh, although they live in widely separated corners of the world, and at different levels of economic uh, hardship, in fact. They are in one single pool of labor. And employers know this and force them to work against each other's uh, interest, in a sense, by making them compete. Or certainly their employers compete with each other, and the way they compete with each other from country to country is by forcing down the wages of their employees. Now this is part of our experience here in the United States, uh, not just in developing countries. Uh, these pictures come from a uh, raid that was uh, performed in uh, August of 1995. Uh, the Immigration and Natural, what it was then called Immigration Naturalization Service, uh, and the California Department of uh, Labor Standards Enforcement have been given a tip that workers were being held against their will in a uh, small uh, apartment complex. You can see the back end of it on the lower part of the screen uh, uh, outside of Los Angeles, 18 miles due east of Los Angeles. 72 workers had been held in this apartment complex as prisoners. The oldest or the longest held had been there for seven years. They were making clothing. You can see the workshop there. Uh, they were making uh, clothing that appeared in mainstream department stores. Mervyn's, Miller's, Mon Montgomery Ward still existed at that time. May. Uh, which is the parent of uh, Target, uh, Nordstrom, Sears, Target, and so on. Um, thank you for laughing at that. Uh, 
In fact, there was a double uh, horror in this story. Uh, in order to hide the source of the, the shirts and uh, blouses that came out of this shop, uh, the employers made it appear that they were being made in downtown LA where there was actually a shop uh, making for the same uh, uh, contractor. The shop that they uh, laundered, as it were, the clothing through, itself was a sweatshop. The only difference between the two was that the one in, in this picture uh, uh, had 72 Thai prisoners in it. The one in downtown LA had uh, a couple of dozen Mexican uh, sewers and cutters. Um, the good news is that those scared and frightened young women uh, eventually collected between them over $4 million in back pay, the 72 workers, and in return for their testimony in court against their employers, they were given green cards. Uh, only one of the workers of the 72 was not located and in time for this settlement and therefore got neither the money nor the green card. But seven, 71 of them had a good ending to the story. It's a great dramatic story. I wish somebody would make a film out of it with a young woman jumping through the window to escape and ending up at a, a Thai language church in downtown LA and her boyfriend writing a letter to uh, the INS and then a dawn raid at uh, 4 a.m. It's really a good story. Now, technically speaking, <clears throat> what uh, my work set out to do is ask a question, what was the size of this problem in the United States? And uh, nobody had, uh, before my work or after it, had attempted to make an estimate of that. And to begin that work, I had to decide what a sweatshop is. The Encyclopedia Britannica defines a sweatshop as a place of uh, long hours, low pay, and oppressive conditions. But long and low and oppressive to some might be a decent, hard-working job to others. So one needed a uh, way to make objective the definition in order to say the problem is this size or that size. And I adopted a legalistic uh, definition, which is the same one the Congress adopted and the Congress's uh, uh, accounting agency, the so-called General Accounting Office. <clears throat> and that is to find a switch up in terms of American labor law, the, uh, fair, in particular the Fair Labor Standards Act of uh, 1938 which uh, sets the minimum wage, which is adjusted periodically uh, after much controversy. Uh, outlaws child labor in manufacturing, and in this particular industry, relevantly, uh, outlaws uh, industrial production at home uh, in the name of being able to enforce the minimum wage, which can't really be enforced if you have massive amounts of work being done in home uh, living rooms. So if you have a place that doesn't pay overtime, that doesn't pay the minimum wage, that has dangerous environmental circumstances, the GAO says it's a sweatshop, that is, multiple labor law violations. <clears throat> to understand how, uh, why I say there was a decline and rise in sweatshops, we need to retrace the steps, first of victory and then of subsequent uh, loss of that victory. <clears throat> And we begin with yet another uh, heroine, a woman named Clara Lemlich. Uh, she was the heroine of uh, one of the great uh, labor stories of the 20th century, the, uh, what came to be called the Revolt of the 20,000. In 1909, 1910, what were then called shop girls uh, in New York, the shirtwaist makers, uh, uh, began a strike. Uh, they struck against the biggest uh, dressmakers at the time, a firm called Leesersons and another firm called the Triangle Shirtwaist Co Company. 
swiftly the manufacturers did uh, what uh, is a, uh, a traditional still uh, st strategy of uh, sending the work from the struck factories to other factories and even to home workshops. And so swiftly the workers in this, uh, who had only an infant organization, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, um, uh, called a great meeting in downtown uh, New York. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to see if I have a picture of that meeting. No, I don't, sorry. Um, where they debated whether to have a general strike, where they would strike all of the factories uh, that were making these shirtwaist dresses. The debate went back and forth. The, uh, the stuffed shirts of the day hemmed and hawed. One of the reasons they hemmed and hawed is that they didn't trust the girls. Uh, the labor movement uh, was basically a male movement at the time. And the men in uh, even the uh, clothing industry saw themselves as committed lifelong to their craft, their trade, and to the industry. In the norms and practices of the day, young women who worked in these factories would leave the work upon marriage. And that's one of the reasons their average age was so young. Um, you were old at 25 for marriage in those days, and there were very few workers. Uh, my grandparents were among the exceptions. There were very few workers uh, uh, in their 30s and 40s, women uh, sewing machine operators. And so the men did not trust the women as long-term steadfast allies. It turns out that they were extremely steadfast and very militant. Uh, at the end of the meeting, a voice came from the back, approximately where Professor Dolgan is uh, sitting now. There were 3,000 people in the crowd. Um, I have something to say. Uh, and a very small woman, she was described as a girl in the next day press because she failed to reach five feet high, but she was in fact 23 years old, uh, was passed up over the heads of the crowd. It was, they were so packed. She was, this was the first political moshing in world history <laughs> and placed up on the uh, platform. And Clara Lemlich, uh, again, in what the, uh, the next day press describes as a philippic, that is to say, it's a biblical reference to a, an impassioned speech, and uh, she concludes it uh, by saying, I am one who feels and suffers for the things pictured by the other speakers. I move for general strike. And this was bang on, it, the, exactly the right emotional moment um, and the crowd roared its approval. The strike was held. They lasted a very tough winter. Um, they won union recognition and, and health and safety and wage agreements in all but the one largest firm that held out, the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. And because the Triangle Company held out, the Triangle Company did not sign, they did not have sprinklers, they did not put in the mandatory sprinklers. And on March 25th, 1911, fire broke out on the eighth floor of the Triangle Factory building, now owned by New York University. The flames lapped up out of the windows to the ninth floor. The ninth floor was where uh, there were 300 some odd uh, sewing machine operators. The tenth floor was where management was. The people on the tenth floor either got out quickly or went up to the roof where NYU students from an adjoining building holding the law school helped them to the uh, law school roof. But it was on the ninth floor where people, where the most people were, and they were lining up at the end of the workday. It was a Saturday. They only worked till four o'clock on Saturdays until, instead of seven or eight. They were lining up to leave when the fire broke out. There were two doors, front and back. Um, they went out the front door as fire struck and went down the elevator. And, two uh, Italian guys ran the elevator up and down through the flames for quite a period of time, saving a hundred or so people. 
but eventually the front side of the building was invested in flame. And so they rushed to the back doors and they were locked. And so as the fire continued, bodies piled up and people died of asphyxiation at the back door. Others ran to the windows and jumped from the ninth floor. The, the fire equipment was out there, but there were no ladders at that time that would reach higher than six floors. They jumped onto these canvas rings, which of course uh, were useless. The New York Times reporter calling his story in over the phone to his editor described the sound of the bodies hitting the sidewalk. Francis Perkins, a young reformer uh, working uh, on cons the consumer side of this problem uh, on a label, a no sweat label, happened to have been in Washington Square that afternoon and saw the people falling from the windows. She described in her old age when she worked at Cornell University, she described uh, the, uh, the terrible, terrible sound and the searing nature of this on the conscience of New Yorkers. But the fact of the matter is that the combination of having started a union and then this terrible fire activated the reformers. Uh, and after uh, the fire, a great investigating commission was formed that proposed a series of uh, uh, important reforms in factory safety, in minimum wages, and so on. The head of that uh, investigating commission was a guy named Al Smith was a machine politician who people, uh, the reformers hated him, but Francis Perkins was made the research director. When Al Smith died, somebody said at his uh, funeral, Al Smith only read one book in his life, and that was Francis Perkins. So Perkins, the reformer from Worcester, who went to um, Mount Holyoke, came back to Worcester and worked on factory issues at a settlement house here, uh, then went on to Chicago and back to New York uh, to do this work. Francis Perkins taught Smith that his immigrant voting base were the people dying in the building. And Smith became a social liberal, a economic liberal, and what we think of as the New Deal Coalition, the Roosevelt Coalition, was really the Smith Coalition. He became governor. He took Perkins and made her uh, labor commissioner. He then ran for president unsuccessfully, the first Catholic nominated. Roosevelt became governor of New York and made uh, Perkins a member of his cabinet in New York. Roosevelt then ran for president and made Perkins secretary of labor. Not a popular choice because she was a woman, the first woman in the cabinet. She was the first labor secretary not from a trade union. But it was Perkins who shepherded through the Fair Labor Standards Act that I mentioned earlier. So, by 1938, we had a union in place. We had legislation protecting the minimum wage. Earlier, Social Security had been passed. You had hours legislation as part of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And Life magazine called the game a little early because really it wasn't until 1940 or so that things palpably improved. But nevertheless, symbolically, as of 1938, uh, they do a feature story, August 1st, 1938, Garment Workers at Play. At play. Um, and it's wonderful. These two young women are at the Jersey Shore where Amer many of uh, uh, New York's working class went to recreate in summer. And they had a paid vacation, brothers and sisters. That's what they had won. And that's why they are so happy. And me for them. So let's see if we've got this. There are really three takeaway lessons from this. One is that workers finally, uh, in the course of the first half of the 20th century, were able to defend their own interests. They formed unions, basically. Second, there were good alliances with reformers like Perkins, like Fran uh, uh, Florence Kelly of the National Consumers League, um, like the reformers uh, associated with Roosevelt. And third, together, 
the labor liberal coalition, so-called, was able to get legislation that protected their ability to defend themselves. They got the Wagner Act in 1935 that made organizing unions better or more easy. They got um, social security, they got minimum wage, and so on. The three pillars of decency, self-defense, alliance, public policy. And for a time, uh, you can see that uh, there was relative success. At the end of the war, the uh, average garment worker was making 90 some odd percent of what the average manufacturing worker was making. And the average manufacturing worker was at the brink of the moment of earning middle income, of being at the middle of the income distribution. Thus began an era in which uh, American English became totally confused because uh, that began the period of time we started calling manufacturing blue collar workers middle class because they had won pretty good incomes. You saw in the graph below uh, uh, previously the decline of uh, apparel workers as a fraction of manufacturing workers. And one of the reasons uh, for that is that over time their employers, apparel workers employers, became more and more ruthless. So by the 90s, 60% uh, of the uh, cutting and sewing shops in uh, downtown LA, which had become the largest center, had succeeded New York as the largest center of production, failed to pay the minimum wage or uh, overtime pay and or had important uh, health and safety violations, thus meeting the definition of, quotes, sweatshop. It was pretty much the same uh, in New York uh, in the same period of time. Uh, remember, please, that uh, especially in the more recent period, uh, in apparel manufacturing, the labels that you've ever heard of, the brand names you have ever heard of, no longer own factories. They make designs, uh, advertising campaigns, and uh, profits. The people who make clothing you have never heard of, they are contractors where Nike, for example, never owned its own factory. For those of you who have ever gotten your Dress for Success business suits uh, from, say, uh, Liz Claiborne, uh, Liz Claiborne sold its last factory uh, in the uh, late 90s and so on. Now they're all made uh, by uh, nameless contractors. So roughly 60% of those shops in those centers of production, those nameless contractors, uh, are violating the law. We might ask, say, why? Um, these numbers are uh, large but shrinking, and it's not because conditions are getting better, but rather the jobs are going away. Because even if you break the law and pay a worker $3 an hour or $4 an hour in New York or LA, Bangladeshi or Chinese workers are getting much less than that, less than a dollar an hour. And so when the, when the multiplier becomes three, four, five, six, ten to one, then uh, you are willing to shift your production contracts to a different place. So the fact that the number, my estimate, my quantitative estimate of the number of sweatshop workers is shrinking isn't because conditions are getting better, but the jobs are going away. Now, to the extent that they're not going away, this is not an obscure piece of business. This is not, you know, shady underground stuff that you can't find. This is uh, Dorchester Avenue, for those of you who know Boston. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Dot Ave, it's called. Uh, this store, uh, I, it's a little foggy. You can't see. It's modern dress. My, uh, I don't make my living as a photographer. Uh, uh, in uh, 96, I remember, well, it was Yom Kippur. Um, it was my day of atonement that I went to look at shitty shops. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, this was 
Clearly, at some point in its history, this was a retail establishment, a corner grocery store, or perhaps a uh, drug store. Um, but uh, it had been converted to a dress shop. The back door out of sight was locked from the outside. There was a rusty padlock on it. The front, you'll see, there's a grate two-thirds of the way down. Inside there, I don't have a picture of it, were about 15 workstations. The aisles were clogged with uh, uh, polyester uh, fleece uh, garments being sewn for a contractor, the, a, a brand over in Cambridge. Uh, and please imagine a, a frayed wire or a cigarette or whatever uh, sending out that uh, lethal plastic smoke uh, and fumes into the shop. The girls rushed to the front of the shop. The door was not a push-out door, it was a pull-in uh, pull door. They're trying to pull it in. People are pushing from the back. You've got the grate that you actually have to get on your hands and knees to get in the store. There's a little triangle fire tragedy uh, happening right there in that shop. It was later shut down, not because that's the preferred way to cure it, but because after three front page stories in the Boston Herald, the uh, employer still had not cleaned up his act. Uh, same thing in downtown L.A. office buildings, the old 1920s downtown in L.A. Uh, offices have been converted to industrial use, and that's the locked back door that I found uh, there. I'm not skilled enough to know when wiring is dangerous, but I know when I see a locked door. Now, <clears throat> So I've suggested to you already that there's something about the contracting system and global competition that is causing deterioration, or caused, past tense, deterioration in American workers' conditions. And this is a very simple-minded graph. Uh, on the one hand, it shows you the relative decline of uh, apparel workers' pay, and on the other hand, the relative extent of uh, imports of clothing uh, to the United States. Uh, what's happening is that uh, contractors who want to make clothing uh, in the United States, uh, there's a phrase that was coined by Business Week, uh, find they have to meet the China price. That is, what every retailer wants to do is uh, compare the cost per thousand dozen. That's the way in the business contractors bid prices. The cost per thousand dozen and compare what you're offering as a contractor to the offer that they can get in China. Now, that you may come in a little higher than the China price because you're, you're, you're a little closer, because uh, of whatever, uh, but that's the standard, that's the reference point that they use. This produces then a competition that's become known as the race to the bottom. And here you see my young woman in Nicaragua and the house that I mentioned to you before. Um, there's been a relative increase in uh, garment work in Nicaragua and a relative decrease in the Dominican Republic, as a matter of fact. Nicaraguan garment workers make about a quarter of what Dominican workers make. So that's the first reason, is this unrestrained global competition. The second reason is that as a result, partly a result of that unrestrained competition, worker self-defense mechanisms are flagging. The yellow line is the overall rate of uh, union membership uh, in the private sector in the United States through, um, we've lost our bottom line, through the year 2000. It continues to go down, unfortunately. Um, the blue line is, uh, I don't have numbers going all the way back to 1950 as I do for the others, but the blue line uh, is union uh, density in apparel work, which as of 2000 had gone down to 6%, and I guarantee you it's below 3% now um, uh, with the loss of uh, jobs. <coughs> The Fair Labor Standards Act uh, set up an agency within the Department of Labor. Now I'm going to give you the bureaucratic stuff. You, there's no particular reason you need to understand it, but I want you to have confidence that I understand it. So that's why I'm telling you. Uh, 
Within the Department of Labor, there's something called the Employment Standards Administration, and which is charged with a implementing a series of federal laws. And within the Employment Standards Administration is the Wage and Hour Bureau. These are the people who go to different establishments and uh, either in high-tech computer ways or actually manually looking at time slips, uh, check as to whether an establishment is paying the minimum wage, is paying overtime, biding by the overtime rules, you know, time and a half uh, over uh, 40 hours, double time on weekends, etc. Um, and otherwise enforcing the law. Now, uh, although I'm a a person who believes in equality, arguably, you could describe me as a person of the left. I don't believe human beings are angels. I actually think there's a role for police. I think that if we fired all of the Worcester police, we'd have more uh, traffic accidents and breaking and entry. And that's exactly what we get in the federal government. In uh, back in the Eisenhower era, there was one wage an hour um, enforcement agent for every 46,000 workers in the economy. <clears throat> there were no sweatshops to speak of. It was not a problem in the 1950s. But as we get to the 90s and 2000, we can see that the number gets to 150, 140,000 workers per investigator. I estimated at one point that it would take uh, the wage and hour staff an average of 43 years to uh, investigate every garment shop. And in the meanwhile, the fines in the law are ridiculous. You know, you would, uh, for example, you'd risk uh, uh, getting a parking ticket if the fine was a buck, wouldn't you? I mean, as a matter of fact, you do it on purpose. I was once on a consulting job that paid me a good bit of money per day, and I collected Cambridge parking tickets and paid them. So what we've been doing, basically, is firing cops. The labor force grew, the enforcement staff shrank, it's equivalent of firing cops. Think of a guy my age who retires. I'm going to do it someday. And you don't replace that person. And you do that for 10 years, and what you have is 900 investigators instead of 1,500 investigators or 2,000 investigators. That's what we've been doing. De facto deregulation. Nobody wants a government that's larger than we need. The one we have enforcing these laws is not large enough. Sorry about that. The next reason for this problem is concentration in the retail industry. The top few uh, retail firms are the 800-pound gorillas of the industry. Where does an 800-pound gorilla sit? Wherever he wants. And that's what they pay. A, uh, an executive who used to work for Neiman Marcus told a couple of researcher uh, colleagues of mine that in this industry, the power flows down from the retail chains. The price doesn't float up from the cost of production. It comes down as to what the retailer is willing to pay. Walgreen, when I did this analysis, as of 2005, Walgreen uh, had about a 17% market share in apparel and it had been increasing, been increasing at 1% a year, which leads me to estimate that it might be the case that Walgreens sells uh, by dollar uh, value, by, uh, by dollar terms, not volume terms, it would be bigger in volume terms, perhaps 20, 25% of all the clothing sold in the United States, which is a weird, did I say Walgreens? Yes. I didn't mean that, I meant Walmart, thank you. Uh, might uh, sell as much as that. They are the 800-pound gorillas, and they have the power. Finally, uh, uh, anybody who works in higher education or in any uh, urban setting whatsoever uh, can hardly be unaware of the fact that we are living in the second great 
quantitatively speaking, the second great era of immigration in American history. The really, really big one before this was roughly 1880 to 1920. The annual flow of immigrants starting in roughly 1980 or so uh, to now is larger on an annual basis than it was in the uh, 1880 to 1920 business. The impact on our society is only slightly smaller because the population is bigger. Um, and we're not yet at 15% of the population as so-called foreign-born, but we're getting there. So this is a, a, a epochal uh, moment in our social uh, history. Um, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, along with uh, the legal uh, immigrants come a large uh, group of so-called undocumented workers. Uh, one estimate is around 7 million. That's not all of, that's not the entire undocumented population, but the adults who are active in the labor force. Maybe 7 million workers. Now, <coughs> recall uh, that uh, legal residents of the United States do have certain laws and rights uh, at work. Not as much as you'd think. You do not have a right to go to the bathroom. Uh, you do not have the right of free speech at work. Sorry. Um, but you do have the right not to be discriminated against. You do have a, a right not to be paid below the minimum wage, uh, and so on. But an undocumented worker is in the dangerous situation of risking deportation if he or she complains about illegal treatment. It is not legal to pay an undocumented worker below the minimum wage, but on the other hand, a very bad Supreme Court decision has said, although it's not legal to pay, nor is it uh, necessary to pay large back wages because you shouldn't be paying people you shouldn't hire. Uh, so the law is in a total muddle in this regard. It's one of those things that's it's not a headline issue like choice or abortion, but it's a terrible decision that requires redress in the long run. At any rate, uh, the uh, legal immigrants uh, are not so much at risk uh, for this kind, of, well they are at risk for sweatshop uh, employment, uh, but one of the things that makes the industry uh, have low uh, standards is that the large group of undocumented workers in the industry uh, do not have recourse to complain. <coughs> So, thinking about the era when workers were relatively successful and trying to uh, cast that into the future, uh, we can think about the three pillars of decency going forward. Uh, one is uh, we need a rebirth of uh, a, a legal and constitutional environment where workers can adequately defend themselves. The Wagner Act of 1935 uh, was an important step forward in the 20th century. It was once described as the Magna Carta for labor, but it has now been so severely eroded by court decisions, by bad uh, regulatory appointments, and so on, that it's almost useless. In fact, it's almost counterproductive. Um, and so uh, there will come before Congress uh, uh, in the new year of 2009 something called the Employee Free Choice Act, uh, which will make it easier for people to join unions without jeopardy, quarter of union act, uh, activists who try to organize plants nowadays or shops or stores uh, are in danger of getting fired, for example. Uh, this would uh, curtail that kind of activity. Second, uh, I want uh, to uh, all of us to uh, think uh, about our own priorities. If I had gone back a hundred years from now <clears throat> and asked the famous reformers and so-called liberals or progressives of uh, the turn of the 20th century, Jane Addams, or uh, as I mentioned, Florence Kelly, or the, the men and women uh, around uh, even Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, in that era, the first decade or so of the 20th century. 
what are the most important issues facing the nation? What are the most important reforms? They would have mentioned things like child labor. They would have talked about the social question, meaning the inclusion of working class people economically and socially into the community. Um, nowadays, when you ask people that question, you don't get the question of labor rights in the top five or even top ten priorities. As the son of a two uh, trade unionists, I can tell you I would not have become a professor had not my parents' generation and grandparents' generation uh, attained in politics and, and economics and uh, reforms uh, what they attained. It wouldn't have been possible for me. Um, so we need to think about our own priorities and think exactly why is it we have such a bad attitude about labor and labor unions uh, and may it be that not only are we slaves to fashion, we're slaves to bad reportage and loose thinking. Moving right along. Um, the most important arena of public policy, besides changing the fundamental labor law, um, uh, in thinking about issues uh, like globalization and labor conditions, are the terms of agreement uh, that we uh, uh, come to with other countries in terms of trade. Remember that uh, the first reason for the rise of sweatshops in the United States was the way we did globalization. What we did was, we promised investors that the world would be a more lawful place, more predictable, more safe. There would be recourse if other countries did nasty things or if uh, uh, country, uh, nations um, nationalized facilities. All of these things guarantee investors. And none of the agreements into which we have entered guarantee the rights of laborers to organize, to bargain, uh, against discrimination at the workplace and so on. Uh, so these are things that uh, need uh, address in a new administration. We end as we began. Uh, I found this uh, young woman in a Beijing garment factory. She's a trimmer. It's the lowest paid uh, job in a garment factory, taking the thread ends off uh, buttonholes and, and uh, hems and seams. They're making uh, Russian overcoats, wool overcoats for the Russian market. Uh, she didn't even have a, a chair. She's sitting on the floor, and you can tell from her expression that she's not a happy camper. Um, I think of her when I uh, think about this issue and these problems. What, I don't know what she was thinking. You know, was she hoping some boy back home would want to marry her? Was she thinking about when she might get off? It was a Saturday. They were going to work the next day. They had been working for 10 days. The employer, who I pretended to be a buyer of shirts, the employer said, oh, no, we don't, we'll be working for the next two weeks or so. Um, in 1912, the poet uh, Jerome Oppenheimer uh, wrote a very famous poem that some of you know as a song, Bread and Roses. Um, and one line in it uh, was as follows. Our lives shall not be sweated from birth until life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses. Thank you very much.